I remember back in 1972, Pastor called all her children together. We met around the kitchen table. She shared with us the message that God had given her years ago, that she had a rose garden in her backyard. All she had to do was cultivate. She said she was standing in the kitchen window years later, and God spoke to her again and said, Arise, now is the time. She called us together at 2224 Loyal Drive. We met around a small wooden kitchen table. All of Bishop Jenkins' children and a senior, Mother Ella Wesley. At that time, Mother Ella Wesley was made the treasure of the church. When Bishop shared the message of God, we were all in agreement and excited. Then in September, we had our first official service on Campostella Road. Not the whole building, but we had one of the small annexes. And there we had services. From that point on, the gentleman that owned the property asked Bishop if she would like to purchase the whole building. God made a way and allowed her to find favor. And that's when we became the church with the red doors, which everyone recognized when they came across the Campus Della Bridge. God blessed us immensely with his spirit and his power in that building. And then they came through and said they wanted to purchase the church's land to expand the highway. Well, make a long story short, Elder D.L. Wilson was walking by and he saw this building. But many years before, Pastor Burton, who's the pastor now, said he walked by and he saw this church many, many, many times and would like to have this church for our church. Long story short, God opened up the doors and we found favor with the Catholic Church diocese in this location. We were able to purchase the church, the land next to it, which could all consist of nine blocks. God blessed us to pay off this mortgage from the vision and the information of the financial plan to our pastor, Bishop Jenkins. When she called all the members together to tell us the plan that God had given us, seven years this church was paid off due to the following of the instructions of God had given our leader. I thank God for her standing strong on the word of God. She was ostracized and criticized from many, many sides as we know because she was a woman of God. But she was a woman that was chosen by God. And I remember as she began to age gracefully, the one request that she made to Elder Burton and I was this, children, bring me to church even if you had to put me in a scripture. That was fulfilled until her doctor wrote the order and says, no more trans transferring her. She's to remain homebound. But to the end, Bishop Jenkins carried the word of God in her heart. You go to her at her bedside to pray for her, and she switched the prayer around, and you could feel that she was praying for you. God appointed her, anointed her, for to be the pastor here at Mount Gilead Pentecostal Holiness Church. Mount Gilead impacted my life in many ways, and in, in every way, uh, from the time that I, I came up until the, to the present. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I got so many things going in my mind. This Nancy B. Jenkins opened her arms to me. Nobody was a stranger with our Bishop Jenkins. She was lovable, she cared for you, regardless of the circumstances that you were in. But I do have to say that Bishop Jenkins and my mom, I felt like were, were best friends. Because they talked every day. Uh, Bishop Jenkins encouraged me. And there was nothing that I could not talk to B Bishop Jenkins about. Who is uh, Bishop Nancy B. Jenkins? She is a... She is, was, and a, uh, not only a, a great bishop and pastor, she was also a friend and a mother to me. I 
to tell this story. Okay, I have to tell this story because this is how I got impacted by uh, coming to this church on a regular basis. My daughter, we call her Pumpkin. I was in the kitchen. I always got them ready for church because they went to church with my mom. I did not go to church. I was not a regular church goer. I, rem I remember the argument as if it was yesterday. She comes in the church, comes in the uh, kitchen, and she says, uh, Ma, when are you going to church? I said, I'll be there. I'm coming. She says, no, you, you coming now. I was like, uh, no, ma'am, I'm not coming. She said, well, I tell you what, I'll stand here until you get ready. And I told her, she didn't get her Booty, booty, booty in that van. <laughs> when the van come, van come, it was going to be, it was going to be on. She said, "We will finish this conversation when I get back from church." That's how firm she was. She loved the Lord at a very young age, and this is why I am at Mount Gilead Pentecostal holding this church today behind my daughter. What is one of your fondest memories of Bishop Jenkins? Her kindness, her sweet spirit, and most that I loved about her that I've learned from observing her was she was slow to answer, and the answer that she would give most of the time was, let me pray about it. Or we knew her so well that when she just became silent when you asked the question, there was always a peaceful look on her face to let you know without her speaking, she was going to care before God. Granny was a feisty lady. Um, she always, you know, well-dressed. Oh, my. Well-dressed. When we would go to her nursing home, you know, because Granny had a nursing home. Bishop had a nursing home. She was always dressed, Sunday morning ready. Yeah. Sunday morning ready every day. Um, and, um, you know, she wouldn't. She would have a, a nice way of reading somebody real nicely. Yeah. And you would be so confused by the time she done laid you out, you wouldn't know if she laid you out. You, it didn't register to you until about sometimes the next day that she just sat there and laid into you so nicely. She never raised her voice. She wasn't, you know, loud and boisterous. She would always tell me, you're so loud, loud. I'd be like, I'm loud. Um... I will always sit back and watch Granny. You know, I, I was that grandchild well, at our house. We were like the grandchildren that would, you know, sit back and just watch. And we would have to pick Granny up every Wednesday night for Bible study and Friday night for joy night. And she would get in, Daddy would go in and get her, have her walk down the steps, get her in the car. Mama would have her blanket and Granny want the heat up and we were all in the van burning up. <coughs> It was hot in that van. And you know, daddy would crack the window. He had the window, mama had the window, but we were in the back suffering. You know, and so we would be so glad to get to church and we get to church and you know, we had, you know, church. And then we would all be like, here we go. Roasted can of peanuts. One of my fondest members of Bishop Jenkins is that at one point I was going to leave the church because of something that went on. And you know how you get blindsided some, sometimes? And I went home and I told my mom, that's it. I'm out. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't want to be part of any type of church that have that stuff going on. And uh, two days later, she called me and she said, baby, honey, I know you was upset when you left, but you can't let the devil get the best of you like that. The next Sunday, I was right back here in my corner seat over there in the pew. Yeah. Yes. Bishop mm. Jenkins was just, oh, hot. Oh, man, if you didn't have her in your life, you don't know what you was missing. Well, I became a son. The first time I met her was um, at the Pentecostal church I belonged to where I was saved. They visited there, and um, we only had an organ. We didn't have a piano, and so I jumped in and played for them there and um, she had mentioned that she asked the Lord for a son like me not knowing that I would see them again a whole year later and the Lord reunited us
encouragement of Bishop when everybody was saying to us, y'all must be crazy taking all those kids. Well, they came from all different backgrounds. But Bishop said to me, she said, Faith, I want you to ask God to give your children a blood transfusion. And when we took those kids to the altar and put their names in the prayer box, look what God has done to those young people that we took into our household, brought them into the, our household of faith, the church family, and they bonded together and learned what true love is all about. One of my fondest memories of Bishop Jenkins was, she had told me to, uh, to call a brother and uh, to, uh, for him to uh, come to her. And I found a brother, and I was talking to him, and I said, Young man, you had a whole heap of trouble. And as soon as I said that, it was a tap on my shoulder. And it was Bishop, and she was saying, I didn't tell you to tell him that. I was vocal, uh, and sometimes I had the wrong time. <laughs> Um, and um, I was set down several times and I still, though I was set down in silence, I still was on church on time, Sunday school, everything. I was still here and by the time it was time to stop morning service, Bishop would look at me and call me to the office and say, you need to take your place. In other words, I need to get on the organ, but I still was silenced. Mm -hmm. But I saw but I didn't talk. <laughs> So, so the lesson that even when you're reprimanded, you're supposed to stay faithful. Yes, and she was just so loving. It didn't matter what she said to me. I was not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Because it was what I needed. Did Bishop Jenkins ever have to correct you? If so, give me an example. Shy, please, all the time. Lord, have mercy, mouthpiece. I was a mouthpiece. And did she, she would say faith. And when she said my name, I know that was her discipline me when she raised that eyebrow. Oh, I can't count the times. I can't even use my fingers and toes to tell you. But she always did her correction in such a loving spirit that she would break down and cry. And she ain't said much. She might just look at you. And we all know that was just the spirit of the Lord. I can't, I can't number the times that I was set down by her. Because they sat down. No, uh-uh. No, not that side. No, mm-mm. I wasn't going to give them this side of her. No, 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 no. I saw too much of people getting corrected to know that, okay, there is a thin line here. I'm, I'm, mm, -mm. No, mm, -mm. <laughs> So, you know, you never wanted, you know, none of the children, grandchildren ever wanted to uh, get in trouble by granny, right? I remember one time I was a little girl and mom and daddy had went somewhere on a trip and I was always upset when they would go to a trip. We had to go to Granny House. They left me at Granny House. Uh, but we always ate good because it was always uh, great northern beans and fried pork chops and sweet potatoes. And I like that. Uh, but Granny had this cast iron stove or whatever it was. I don't know. It was some antique thing. And I was always fascinated by it. And so Granny was in the kitchen cooking fried chicken. Anyway, she was in there cooking. And that was my opportunity to finally mess with this antique heater thing or whatever. And I kept messing with it. And she kept coming around the corner. What you in there doing? I'm like, nothing. And I kept messing with it. So I finally got it that I could open up the, the, the door of it. Where they would put the wood in or whatever. And um, I opened it up. 
and I put my little doll baby in there, you know, because I wanted my doll baby to see what was inside. And but I couldn't close it because the doll baby's legs was hanging out. And so I pushed it hard, but when I pushed it, the door broke. So I fixed the door. I concocted the door so Granny wouldn't see that I had broke it. But some of us, she saw that I had, she knew I had broke it. And she beat me. <laughs> I was so hurt. Like, but it wasn't even like a like a, a whipping whip. It was like she came in and popped me. And I was so disappointed that Granny popped me. It was just a pop. You know, it wasn't that bad. But, oh, and she says, I can't believe you broke it. Oh, I cried. Oh, I cried for day. I still remember that. She popped me. And then when I got older, you know, I was living in the world of sin. As Granny was saying, she said, you know, you, you were out there and you look like sin. Oh, and I'll never forget, I had really done something real bad. I had ran off and got murdered. And, you know, mama had called Granny. You know, that was the worst thing ever. When your parents tell you, I'm telling Granny. Oh, my goodness. You got married to your first husband, right? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and oh, she said, I'm, I'm telling you, Granny. And so Granny, mama called Granny, told Granny. Mama yelled down the stairs, Nikki, pick up the phone. Granny on the phone for you. Pick up the phone. Hello. She starts singing. Her song, when you know you were going to get a granny killing, was there was a young lady who sat in the church pew. She heard if I message and knew it was true. <laughs> she was singing the whole song. You had to sit on the phone. She was singing the song. By the time she finished singing the song, you crying. And she says, I can't believe you will break my heart. I said, again, first it was the, the door to the store when I was a little girl. Now it's this. Oh, it was terrible. She said, you broke my heart. You went out and ran and got married. And you know I have a church. We don't get married like that. Now we got to plan a whole wedding. So I had to get married again in the church. But Granny was so hurt. And she said what she said. And then she hung up. She never said bye. She just hung up. It was terrible. How was the music and the musicians and the choirs singing here over the years? I was a musician. Uh, I wasn't like a famous musician, uh, super talented, but I gave what I had. And when God was in his anointing, um, I was taught that way. Mm -hmm. Blessed assurance, my hope is built, those hymns, and some to the, uh, contemporary songs. Oh, man. Singing, 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 children singing, everybody singing. We had a uh, adult choir, a uh, youth choir, a uh, combined choir. Uh, uh, we would go out to uh, fellowship with other churches uh, singing. We were singing church. It was the bomb. You <laughs> hear me? I'm telling you, the spirit connects because sometimes the Bishop Elder Copeland would be thinking of a song and Elder Burton, who's Pastor Burton now, will automatically start singing the song without her ever telling her. The choir was anointed. I remember an incident, you know, we were sm on small membership and didn't have a lot of money, but God made a way. We went to a church to sing and everybody had on fancy robes. And we went up there to sing, looking like Job's coat. That's what Bishop said we looked like because we all had on our Sunday best, you know. And we went up there to sing, and Bishop could hear the people laughing and whispering. She closed her eyes and she began to pray for her choir as they went forward. And I can say this, that particular Sunday, I'll never for, even forget the church we went to. The power of God came down and he sent down the angels. And God sent his word through us singing. We were a choir that would come to rehearsal and have prayer and praise and be on one accord for rehearsal. And I thank God for every, every experience that we had down through these 50 years. Oh, the music was absolutely superb. I remember a time that, like I say, I started I was going to church, but I was not into church. And I never forget the time that I was at this 
so-called club and an elder um, Bishop Copeland was in the back she was she was a cook and it was New Year's Eve and she came out and she sung and the whole club lost it I mean she just the spirit of the Lord just just twinkled down the walls and she could sing Oh, she, ooh, mm, mm, mm. she could fill the room with glory. That's just the way I, I saw the music. We had two microphones, one on the podium and one was for the lead. And that was it. That's right. And so when we would have choir rehearsal, Aunt Vita, co-pastor Alvita Copeland, a singer machine, she would come in and we would sing and she would say, are you ready? And everybody had to come in in harmony and singing from your diaphragm, yes, yes. And she would make us hold it and she was, are you ready? And we had to say yes, no microphone. We had to sing to make sure that our voice filled the entire room. So we didn't need to rely on a microphone because we were our own microphone. Regardless of whether the musicians were loud or not, we had better sung over top of them and sang in harmony. And she was saying, oh, she would tell you, don't come in here without whispering. Don't come in whispering. Don't nobody want to hear no whisper song. Jesus can't hear no whisper. You better open up your mouth and sing. So when we were singing, and now to this day when I sing, you know, it's kind of hard for me now. The new style of music is the whisper music. You know, everybody want to whisper to Jesus now. So it's a little difficult for me because all I know is you better open up your mouth and sing so Jesus can hear you. And we would sing and, I mean, we had a good old time. I remember every convocation, uh, Daddy, with a pastor, would go and it was some band. I don't know this man. I, I, I think he's probably going on to be with the Lord. And it would be him and, and the whole trombone and the trumpet and all kinds of stuff. The man would come and these other boys and they would come. And we had a whole little orchestra over there. On convocation, every convocation. And baby, you talking about we were singing. You couldn't tell us nothing. I'll never forget it. When the splits begin to happen in the church, what made you stay and, and didn't leave? I didn't have anywhere else to go. There was no place, no place else for me to go. This is where I wanted to be. This was my place. First of all, I couldn't understand why the split, you know, because I wasn't behind the scenes. So I never understood why the split. Number two, God didn't tell me to leave. And number three, I won't go leave my brother. That's just the bottom line. The Lord sent me to Mount Gilead. Uh, he blessed me here. Um, I was a, a great teacher. And I learned many, many things, and I was encouraged, and I decided I wasn't going to another church. I was going to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What made me stay? Because God didn't tell me to move. So that's why I stayed. And then when our bishop, Vice Bishop Copeland passed, when she called Elder Burton and I to her bedside to give us the message that God had given her, in her final days, I realized then why God had us to remain steadfast here at Mount Gilead. And I can say this, everything that Vice Bishop Copeland shared with Elder Burton and I, that God showed her in her final days, came to pass. God was preparing us for the job he had for us to do. Bishop Jenkins not only had Mount Gilead here, but she had some other churches that she was a part of and fellowships and organizations that she started. Tell us about some of the other churches that she had. The one that I, I know will always stick with me is the Bellhaven Church in North Carolina, Mount Gilead there. That was a, as we say, we started with the Little Red Church and that's where we really would praise the Lord. The, then Aunt Neva Christ, which was pastor's aunt, which is my great aunt, she opened up a building to start having services. And that's how the Mount Gilead and Bellhaven started, right there. 
And she was also a part of uh, Pastor Whittakenham Church, and then they became an independent church. But it all so many have started right here. Their foundations, even though they have launched out into other branches of Zion to carry on God's work, Bishop, if she was here, would be pleased because all she want was the word of God to be carried on. How would you say they received Bishop Jenkins in the 80s and 90s? Some received it well, others didn't. How did that make you feel? Well, those that were cordial was well, but those that those that weren't was uh, it was heartbreaking uh, because uh, we as human beings shouldn't treat each other uh, unkindly. And uh, but that was the uh, it was the norm of the day toward uh, women. To me. I didn't see Bishop Jenkins as a female pastor. I saw her as a pastor. And I never forget the situation where I was somewhere and the, one of the pastors asked me, uh, where did I attend? And I told him, and he says, oh, you over there with that female pastor? And I was like, yes. I said, but don't forget the Bible said that God can use anyone. And I didn't ever see her as a female pastor. I just saw her as a loving and kind pastor. I think now it impacted the uh, community uh, a great deal. Uh, we were we were a part of the uh, community and we did things in the community from uh, door to door to to uh, uh, food bank to a uh, picnic in the park and uh, these things. We were uh, in the community and, and doing things in the community. We used to, before COVID, we used to have like a, 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 a picnic in the uh, park. We used to give away clothes. We used to uh, give away school supplies on a regular basis. We invited people into the church, even if they was going somewhere else. It was just like a uh, granny home cooking feeling in here. How did you take when Bishop Jenkins passed? When you got the news that she passed? Well, sad, happy, and sad. Said that she was gone, and glad that, in the sense that she didn't have to suffer anymore. She was my my spiritual mother. To be honest, I was sadder watching her ill when she died. I celebrated her death in my heart. I still grieved, um, but I celebrated her rest. The it was it was sad, but she would always tell us, you know, you know, she's going to go home sooner yeah. or later. It was it, it was when she passed. It was sad. But to me, it was heartwarming because in my mind, in the back of my head, I'm going, oh, her and mama going to have a good time talking now. That's the only way I could feel good about, you know, coming to grips with it. I, I'm like, oh, she's going to be walking around up there and, you know, helping people and twinkling her toes in the water, all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Well... Um, I will tell you I was happy. And the reason why I was happy because I was one of the nurses that took care of Granny. I never thought that day would come either. That I would actually go over to my grandmother's house every night, bathe her, 
change her diaper, get her dressed for bed, you know, or help feed her or something. Um, I never thought that day, and I remember the first day I went over there, Granddaddy called me, because Granddaddy kept firing all the nurses. <laughs> Granddaddy was something. Fired him. So he said, tell Nikki come. He told Mama to tell me to come over there. So I went over there, and I went over there, and I said, Granddaddy, I'm here to take care of you, and I'm going to give you, you know, nice, wash you up and get you ready for bed. And as I was washing her, she says, and at round about the end, Granny didn't have too many words. She says, I remember when I used to change your diaper and wash you. And now you are doing the same for me. And she didn't say anything else after that. And I cleaned her and I saw how my grandmother's body began to break down. And I said, God, this is not how I am pictured. Granny wanted to, you know, be 101. She was 94 years old. And I said, this is not what she, my grandmother took care of people. She was a nurse. And so for this to go like this, I was like, this shouldn't be. And, you know, just to see her deteriorate right before my eyes, it was too much. So when I got the phone call that she had passed, I said, thank God. But it broke my heart. It didn't hit me until, I want to say they were closing the coffin. That, wait, is this real? And um, to witness my father and my mother and my aunt and, you know, Elder Kelly and everybody just kind of just, I saw them broke because... I feel his leader was gone. I couldn't I had to wrap up my tears. So I never dealt with it. I just moved on.
that she taught us in the Word of God. And that's how I keep surviving when I think about my mother has gone. But she used to would tell us one day, I'm going home, Faith. But I want you to remember, always stand on the Word of God. If you have to stand by yourself. And in this day and time, when you stand for holiness, from Genesis to Revelations, as she said, you have to sometimes stand by yourself. Did Bishop Jenkins have a saying that she would love to say? Or, or one of her sayings? I know she had many. Uh, this morning I thought about it, and one of them was, be happy and sin not. She would tell us as young people, be happy and sin not. Uh, there were many times um, she would just always have something rich to tell us or to encourage us. Did you ever think that you would be the pastor of Mount Gilead? No. Did you ever want to be the pastor of Mount Gilead? No. <laughs> what did you do when Bishop told you that you would be the gatekeeper? Well, being her assistant pastor, I still... Um, like being on the organ at that time, uh, out of the way, you know, uh, in my own little corner, doing my own little thing as the Lord led. Um, but I was obedient to my leader. And um, there was times of controversy. And when the Lord told me um, to just be still, praise the Lord, and uh, this fight's not yours. Mm -hmm. In other words, he was letting me know it's a battle that he had to handle. And just for me to be silent, to be still. Tell us about Weldon Burton, your brother. <laughs> hey. You know, me and my brother, growing up, we were together all the, always, growing up till we got to a certain age. We went to school together, we played together. Uh, he, I taught him how to play marbles, bobby jacks. I even a couple of times had him helping me dress my dolls. But, but then after we got to a certain age, we start bickering. And I never forget the day that me and him got in a serious physical fight. He actually hit me back. I, I went in the room and told my mama, I was like, no more hit me. She was like, and what did you do to him? I was like, well, I hit him. So we got to fight, and I have that scar on my arm right now where when he hit me, I hit the nail. So ever since that day, you know, we don't, I didn't, we didn't fight anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to describe your brother now, we're not talking about your brother, we're talking about Pastor Burton. Tell us some things about Pastor Burton. Pastor Burton is dependable. He's lovable to me. And, you know, he's only going to straighten you out with that firm father voice if it's necessary. Oh, my relationship with uh, Pastor Burton, buddy, friend, elder, pastor, uh, family member, mm -hmm. a whole gamut of things. Mm -hmm. If you had to describe Pastor Burton in three words, what would they be? That's my mo. That's my mo. <laughs> it has been a journey, and this is nothing that none of us wanted. I remember praying as a little girl in this church. God, please bring a stranger off the street to get saved and granny fall in love with them and let them become the pastor of this church. Because this church has been good and it has been bad. And I have seen my father endure some you talking about some church hurt child please I've witnessed it as a little girl all the way up until my adult years of my father enduring church hurt 
and it happens in every church, right? You know, it's just not here. You know, it happens in every church. When you go to churches, you know, you hear about it. And to witness it, I said, I hope somebody else come because don't nobody want that headache. Don't nobody want that, that, that heartache. It's, it's too much, you know? Just let my father keep playing. He enjoys that, you know? He plays, my hope is building blessed assurance. That's his, that's his thing in the key of G, you know? That's his thing. Leave him alone. You know, he don't want to be the pastor of this church. You can have it, you know? But for some odd reason, it was put in God's plan for him to be the pastor. And so when I got the phone call that Granny had, you know, put it in the will for him to be the pastor, first thing I said, why? Daddy don't want that. Daddy just wants to play. Leave him alone. But Daddy took it and he became the pastor. And for years I witnessed my father and my mother hold up the arms of my grandmother. You know the story in the Bible where the two men hold up uh, the great prophet's arm as they fight. I witnessed that. Not knowing that the tables were turned and here I am, me and Devon holding up my father's arms. You know, it's just funny how the tables turn. Pastor Burden is a steadfast, dependable person. I can say that as a person. He loves the Lord. By the way, that was one of my requests when I asked for a husband. Lord, let him, let him love you, Lord, more than I do. And let him love my mother. God, I had some more specifications, but I'm going to just tell y'all that. And God did just that. Pastor Burden... I can see where God has made grace and made many changes down through the year. But I also realized they were learning experiences for us because God had in plan for the position that we have today. He was being prepared. God is still molding and making us both. In three words, how would you describe Pastor Burton? Not husband, but Pastor Burton. You know I was going to say my man, but anyway. <laughs> How would I describe Pastor Burton? He has become a man of very few words. And I know that's through Christ. Grace has made a change. And he prays before he speaks. That's how I can describe him now. A man of few words that's being led by God. Where do you see Mount Gilead in the future? I see Mark Gill in the future as being a still a church on fire. Uh, with uh, the ministry expanding, with the uh, uh, gospel being preached uh, by all, and it's enough work for, uh, for the church to do. With God help, we would do it. Where do you see Mount Gilead in the future? I have no idea. I, in the future, my mother and my father say they see the church overflowing. And I do see that. How we're going to get there, I'm not sure. But I do know that the Lord reminded me that this church was like a lighthouse. And the light is on and souls will come because the light is back on. And so they're going to come. Put some elbow grease in it. But they're gonna come. I see Mount Gilead as the future is good. They they're gonna just be talking about this church because it's gonna grow. God has a plan. 
you know, even though it was few in numbers, he's still able to bring about his word and just going to lift us up and it's just going to be a glorified feeling in this community. How were you able to respect the brother and the pastor? How did you keep that difference or is there a difference? There isn't a difference. I've always respected my brother. I've always loved my brother. My brother has always had my back and I will always have his. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy uh, for the church and, 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 and the uh, anniversary. Well, we came uh, a long way. Uh, the little time that I have, have been here. We came a long way and many things were accomplished. Many uh, people were saved and uh, many lives were changed. And uh, uh, our growth, we were able to see each other's growth uh, in Christ. How we started out stumbling and, and, uh, in the Word and now we are hopefully mature in the word. But uh, I am I am so happy uh, because I I love this church. I really, really love Mount Gilead. I can't I can't be no closer to it than across the street other than being in here. see Mount Gilead in the future, I don't even have to pause. God has let me know he still has a great work for Mount Gilead and that he was going to take a little bit of people that are going to remain faithful to his word and show the church community what God can do with a few. I mean, that's my father. So, you know, absolutely. I'm proud of him. He didn't have to do it, but he did. Oh, but I'm so glad he did. <laughs> Please come here out there. My mother, as a co-pastor, she supported him, and you know, that's what we do. She, 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 she about it. She about a chick. You know, she holds him down. She holds him down. And so I, I am proud of both of them for keeping the legacy and, and keeping things going and I'm proud of the church happy for them thank you As we celebrate 50 years when thinking of the founder Bishop Jenkins if you had to describe her in three words what would those three words be great woman of God yeah. great woman of God all right great woman of God last thing if you were uh, to leave uh, a lasting thought uh, on this 50 year celebration of Mount Gilead and your six year pastoral anniversary, what would that thought be? It would be, I want God to be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. Not me, but God is God. <laughs> yes, sir.